ACU didn't have the horses to run with Midwestern State. Mustang 70, Wildcats 28. We'll dust off the hoof prints to see what this historic loss does to the Cats' postseason hopes. Giddy up. Chris Thompson Show, right now. A little blast of winter weather a couple of days ago reminds us that we are nearing the end of the season. Just three more games to go in the 2011 Wildcat football campaign, beginning today against Commerce out at Shotwell Stadium. I'm Grant Boone. Welcome to the Chris Thompson Show. Austin Wynn, ACU senior, here along with the head coach, Chris Thompson. Last Saturday night in Wichita Falls, a 70-28 to loss to Midwestern State that tightened the Mustangs' reign on first place in the Lone Star Conference. Coach, statistically the worst loss your team has ever taken. How impressive was that Mustang offense last Saturday night? Well, they were impressive. I mean, uh, from a physical standpoint and the tempo at which they moved, they uh, were as explosive a team as we've ever seen, you know, in the seven years that I've been here, but uh, their execution matched that. I mean, they, they moved fast and they did a great job with their, their scheme, part of what they were doing. And, uh, you know, obviously a, a great performance on their part. Mm -hmm. Coach, as lopsided a loss as that was, two days later you find out the regional rankings. ACU sits five in the region. The top six teams make it. So how much did that, that news turn a, a bad week into maybe a good one? Well, it gives you a boost. I mean, you're coming off a loss like that. Obviously, morale is low. And uh, Monday afternoon you get that, that news. And, and that's kind of where we thought we would be, somewhere fourth or fifth, sixth, somewhere in the region. And uh, but but getting that, you know, allows you to move forward a little bit and start to look forward to the last three weeks and and uh, focus on that and put the loss behind you. Yeah, a lot of football still to play beginning today. We'll take a look at commerce a little bit later on in the show. But when we come back, the good, the bad and the ugly from Midwestern State's big 70 to 28 win over ACU. And yes, there actually was some good, maybe more than you might think. Stay tuned. We'll have the highlights of ACU and Midwestern when we come back in the Chris Thompson show. Midwestern State's new Pony Express delivered a message last Saturday night in Wichita Falls. Here's Austin with a look at the highlights of the Mustangs' historic victory over ACU. Abilene Christian and Midwestern State University in a critical Lone Star Conference matchup of unbeaten teams in Wichita Falls, Texas, home of the Mustangs. It was their homecoming, and they came ready to play. Wildcats have the ball first. Gale quickly to work, hits tight end Ben Gibbs over the middle. Quarterback Mitchell Gale was on fire in the first drive. Here he hits Daryl Cantu Harkless, DCH, 50 yards inside the Mustang 10 yard line. All passes on the first drive for Gale, and he hits Taylor Gabriel. Quick 7 0 lead for the Cats, only two minutes into the game. Remember that play, folks. That was the only time the Wildcats led in the entire game. Quarterback Brandon Kelsey for the Stangs quickly has the Stangs answer. Here he hits David Little, who almost is able to keep his feet. Doesn't matter though, as he finds Edgar Thyler in the back of the end zone. That ties things up at seven. Still only five minutes gone in the first quarter, already a couple of touchdowns. Wildcats look like they might respond back with a touchdown of their own. Gale hits Gabriel, makes a guy miss, runs down the sidelines 18 yards. A critical fourth down though for the Cats. Coach T elects to go for it. Gale hits Darian Hogg in the numbers, hits off his shoulder pad, he drops it, Midwestern intercepts it. It didn't matter though, it was fourth down. And Kelsey. Back to work. Hits Little again. Little runs down the middle of the field, shrugs off a tackle from LB Suggs. Finally is able to be brought down. And running back Kedrick Jackson will finish off that drive with a one-yard plunge. Puts the Mus Midwestern Mustangs up 14-7. Not done, though. Kelsey, next drive, into the end zone, takes it himself. And here's one more highlight before halftime. Kelsey hits Tyler again. Midwestern up 35-7 at halftime? What? It only got worse, but Wildcats come out of the locker room and actually look pretty good. Gale hits Gabriel for Gabriel's second touchdown of the game. Wildcats right, might be right back in this thing if they could have stopped the Mustangs. There's Jackson's second touchdown of the game. Really quickly balloons the lead back up to 28 at 42-14. Here's Jackson again. We'll take it in himself. Midwestern scored five touchdowns in the first half. 
five touchdowns in the second half. And one play to sum up the night came with two minutes left to go in the fourth quarter. Midwestern State backed up at their own one-yard line. Backup quarterback Jake Glover hits receiver Vernon Johnson. Johnson will go untouched 99 yards into the end zone. That's the Stang's 10th touchdown on the night. And that was the final score of the game, thankfully for the Wildcats. 70 to 28 Midwestern. Coach D was glad that this one was over. Shakes hands with the coach. That makes the Wildcats 5 and 2 on the year, 4 and 1 in the Lone Star Conference. That 70 to 28 final set all kinds of records for both schools. Most points and yards Midwestern's ever put up against any school, the most ever allowed by ACU in a non-overtime game. Coach, you always start any recap of a loss, and this is one of the things I love about working with you, with a huge tip of the cap to the other team. So how much was the game last week, however poorly your team may have played in spots, how much was it predominantly about what Midwestern did well? Well, I think that's where you start. I mean, they, they came out and they executed and they had a plan and they made uh, they made the plays that they were supposed to make. Uh, there were There were you know, as we're watching the film, there were points in the game where we obviously looked at it and said, you know, we could have played a lot better. We could have made a play here or there that might have changed the course of the game. But, uh, you know, I always, I always look at it and, uh, and I tip my cap to the other team when they win because they, um, you know, they obviously put the, put the preparation in and did their part and uh, they re they've recruited very well and it showed up on Saturday night. And coach, you see a score like 70 to 28 and I know my first thought as an ACU fan is, you know, where's the defense? I'm sure a lot of other people thought the same thing. But you said after the game that the blame not only falls on the defense, but also on the offense. What did you mean by that? Well, just, you know, in a game like that, you know, we were in a similar game, similar game like that in 2007 with Midwestern where uh, I think the, the score at the half was very similar, and uh, but our offense was able to match, you know, and, uh, offensively, there were times where we executed, and then there were times where we didn't. And uh, you know, the game got out of hand. We weren't able to stay in our normal offensive flow. And and uh, but you know, that's a anytime you lose, there's there's more than what meets the eye. There's more than what the statistics would bear out. And uh, you know, even in the kicking game, we could have put ourselves in better position, field position wise. So uh, all three phases faltered. Credit Midwestern; they did a great job. Let's talk about that offense at Midwestern State. You had been telling us not just before last week's game, but all season long, that what you had seen from them in person, some at the Cowboy Stadium game, the triple header where you saw them play commerce, and then on film, you, were, you kept saying, wow, this team is impressive. Now you've seen them up close, and you saw what they could do against a defense that had been playing pretty well uh, on your team's part. So what makes that offense so hard to stop? Well, first of all, they're, the physicality that they have up front. They have a, uh, some linemen that are, that are really good players. They've got one that's projected second or third, fourth round in the NFL draft, and, and a couple of other guys that are really good. And, uh, and then they've got some experienced running backs that do a great job, and, uh, and I think their quarterback has come a long way. I mean, he, was, he struggled in the Kansas Bowl replacing Eskridge last year, but uh, from that point till now, he's done a great job grasping, grasping their offense. But... They've got a tremendous run game, but they've also got two or three of the best receivers in the region. We said that before the game, and uh, you know when you load up to stop their run, and the quarterback's effective in throwing the ball and the play action, and uh, the receivers, a couple of receivers that they have, little is an ex is explosive a guy as I've seen in our in our league since I've been here, and, and uh, you got to commit to stop to try to stop the run, and nobody's really been able to do that yet, but. Uh, we had a couple of stops in the run game, but they were able to convert some third and 17, third and 20s through the air, and that kills you. You've got to be able to uh, stop that. So I think they're just very well-rounded. I think they can they, – they run the ball, obviously, very well. Uh, the big linemen create space that – they create some space in there in the run lanes that are too big to fill sometimes, but then they can also throw the ball. So it's, it's going to take a great effort to stop them. And – there were actually a couple of bright spots for you guys, uh, believe it or not. Taylor Gabriel, we talk about him every week. Another outstanding performance, over 100 yards receiving, three touchdowns. But also Demarcus Thompson came on in that second half. He actually hadn't caught a pass until Saturday night, and it looked like he couldn't drop anything in the second half. Talk about the bright spots you saw from your receiving core. Well, Taylor, obviously, I think went over 100 yards and again, and just his work ethic each week is really good, and he's preparing well. and. 
Uh, DeMarcus showed up. You know, uh, Jermaine was unable to go in the second half, and so uh, DeMarcus got a chance to get in the flow and play every snap, and he competed very well. I mean, he's a true freshman going out there against very experienced corners from Midwestern State. And, and as he got in the flow of the game, you could see him start to compete and start to get comfortable. And I think that'll do a lot uh, for him as we go throughout the rest of the season. Last thing, Coach, as we put a, a, a wrap on that loss last week, you did not believe that your team had an emotional letdown from the big win against West Texas. It was more of just Midwestern flat out beating your team. What do you expect to see this week as you try to come back from a really disappointing loss? Well, I mean, I, you know, I've said all along, we got great seniors. I think we have uh, as good a group of seniors as there is. And I think uh, as tough a loss as that is, and that, and that one's tough. I mean, that's not your average <laughs> loss, obviously, and that's a, a tough one to bounce back from. But I think we have guys that have great character, and, and that'll, that'll get over that and put that behind them. And uh, obviously, like we talked about, still a lot to play for uh, in terms of uh, playoff pairings and you know, even even anything can happen down the stretch, and, yeah. and all the goals that we've set are still out in front of us. So, um, you know, I expect our guys to bounce back well. Yeah, if WT beats Midwestern a week from today, then there'd be a three-way tie for first right. place as long as your team continues to win. So, uh, you worry about what you can worry about. So, we'll talk about commerce in just a minute, but we'll also, when we come back to the Chris Thompson Show, go up to the JMC Network newsroom and see what's happening around the rest of the world of ACU sports. Back in a moment on the Chris Thompson Show. Welcome back to the Chris Thompson Show. For what's going on in the ACU sports world, here's Taylor Langston and Kristen Goodspeed with the JMC Network Sportscast. Thanks, Austin. Cross Country traveled to San Angelo last weekend to compete in the Lone Star Conference Championships. The men of Eastern New Mexico ended ACU's streak of 20 consecutive championships. Leading the Wildcats was freshman Fabian Wessel Turharn, who came in fifth. Following Fabian were teammates Spencer Lynn, Eric Forster, Will Pike, and Marshall Holland, all finishing top 20. For the women, Chloe Sassette and Elise Goldsmith were ACU's top finishers, placing second and third. Teammate Aisha Rumble was the only other Wildcat to claim a top 20 spot, putting ACU women in fourth overall. November 5th, ACU returns to action in Wichita Falls for the NCAA Division II South Central Regional. The Wildcats hosted Tarleton and Moody on Tuesday, and here's a recap of that game. Wildcats and the Texans battled it out on Tuesday in Moody for the annual Dig Pink match. ACU took the win this time in four sets, and the win over Tarleton gives ACU a 10-5 overall conference record. Freshman Sarah Oxford led the team with 20 kills, while Haley Rhodes had 50 assists, and Kelsey Edwards had 20 digs. Today, the Wildcats will travel to Portales as they face Eastern New Mexico at 2 o'clock. Congrats, Wildcats soccer, for clinching the number one seed this week. On Sunday, ACU shut out A&M Commerce, which raised the team's overall record to 15-0-1. With its conference standing at 11-0-1, not including the game against Midwestern, the Wildcats gained the right to host the LSC Soccer Championship. The men's basketball team is in full swing preparing for the upcoming season set to begin November 1st against Baylor. New head coach Joe Golding is looking to six new players to help lead the team this year. ACU has only won two conference games in the past two years, and Golding is expecting this to be the team to break that streak. Uh, I, I look at it as a challenge, obviously, but it's something that motivates you, and uh, hopefully, hopefully we can turn this thing around. For the JMC Network Sportscast, I'm Taylor Langston. And I'm Kristen Goodspeed. See you next week. One more thing, the ACU golf team got a huge win this week in San Antonio. Team victory and also an individual victory for Alex Carpenter. The kid just keeps on winning. Grant, let's talk big picture here for the ACU team. Three games left to play in this regular season. What do what the Wildcats have to do? Everybody was down, and deservedly so. I mean, you lose – it's bad enough. You lose 70 to 28, worst loss in school history. It's bad. Big picture. You want to make the playoffs, right? No matter where you are. Last year, AC was the number one overall seed in the playoffs, lost its first game, which was a second round game after getting a bye. Number five in the regional rankings, as you mentioned earlier, top six make it in each of the four regions. They're fifth. They have three games left starting today against Commerce. Next week on the road at Kingsville, They've had success down there since 2004. Not an easy place to play, but they've had success the last seven, eight years. And then you're home for Incarnate Word. ACU's three remaining opponents are a combined six and 16. 
doesn't mean you're going to beat them. It means you've got a chance to run the table. And if you run the table, you're going to make the playoffs. Absolutely. And let's go a little farther than the regular season. Let's look ahead to the playoffs. Say ACU stays at number five throughout the rest of the regular season. They enter the playoffs at number five. They'll play the four seed in the first game. Let's say ACU wins that game. Then they will take on the one seed. And it's not looking like Midwestern State's going to lose anytime soon. ACU's going to have to see them again, could potentially. Be. You, you could see them. Now, Washburn plays as, uh, you know, as it's on the MIAA schedule. Washburn is at Pittsburgh State one week from today. Washburn's number four. If they lose to Pitt State, I think they stay in the top six, but they might drop a spot or two. ACU could move up as high as fourth if the Wildcats win out. In that particular scenario, if you're the three or four seed, then you host a first-round game. So there could be playoff football. There could be home playoff football as well. A lot left to play for. It's never quite as bad as it feels in that moment when you get drubbed like they did last Saturday. Absolutely, and I know the Wildcats would love a home playoff football game in November, yeah. maybe a little bit warmer weather True. than they would see up north. Mm -hmm. Kristen Goodspeed will now take a look at some of the players that we don't usually get a chance to talk about on the show, the kickers and punters for the ACU Wildcats. Here's Kristen. Today I'm here with the kickers for the Abilene Christian Wildcats. Morgan Limeberry, who handles place kicking duties, and Spencer Covey, who deals with kickoffs and punts. The real strengthening that we need to do as kickers is for our core because it all centers, it's all around the center of your body. The flexibility, that's the main thing. As long as you can do a reasonable amount of weight on your squats or leg curls or whatever, then you'll be fine. It's because it's not about your leg strength, it's like the biggest misnomer I can think of. Uh, the guys that kick the ball the farthest are the ones that uh, have the fastest legs. And so you almost want to keep your legs light and, fl and flexible, like I said. The wind is definitely the biggest factor. If you're kicking with it, you got to put the ball up higher in the air so the wind, and let the wind carry it. If you're kicking into it, you got to drive the ball more because it's going to, it's basically like it's hitting the wall. I do yoga over the summer, uh, stay flexible, like I said. Uh, I can't say I, I'm into it quite like Spencer is. He does the crazy hot yoga stuff. <laughs> but yeah, no, I do the yoga when I can. I do do yoga. During off season, I do it about three to four times a week. Um, during season, it's hard too because our practice is right during a yoga class. So I don't get the chance to go as much as I'd like. I do wear two different cleats. Um, I wear a football cleat on my plant foot because the cleats on it are actually longer. They provide for a better support. And uh, I wear a soccer shoe on my kicking foot just because it's uh, all leather and you get a better feel for the ball. Soccer was my first love. Um, started when I was about five all the way up until the eighth grade and then started playing football and just transferred my soccer skills into kicking. Thank you guys for sharing your thoughts. For the JMC Network, I'm Kristen Goodspeed. Thanks, Kristen. And when we come back, on set here at the Chris Thompson Show, we'll get Coach T back up here and talk some ACU commerce happening today. Stick around. Back on the Chris Thompson Show, let's take a look at the regional ranking, Super Region 4 in Division 2, Midwestern State with a big win over ACU, now 7-0 and for the first time in school history, and that all-important number one ranking in the regional rankings. If they hold that spot, they would have home field throughout the regional portion of the NCAA playoffs. ACU, you see they're ranked number five. Washburn will play Pittsburgh State a week from today. So a huge matchup coming up in the MIAA. Let's take a look at the Lone Star Conference standings as they stand now. You see Midwestern State leads ACU by that one game. West Texas A&M again next week plays in Wichita Falls. If WT were to knock off Midwestern, then you'd have that three-way tie for first so long as ACU continues to win. And there you see today's opponent Texas A&M Commerce at the bottom of the standings, 0-5 in the conference standings, and also 0-7 overall. Let's turn our attention to today's game against Texas A&M Commerce. Another tough season in East Texas. Guy Morris's Lions, 0-7 overall, near or at the bottom in virtually every statistical category, dead last in points scored and in points allowed. And yet, I look at their roster, and I think about some of the guys who've had some good moments even against your teams in previous years, like quarterback J.J. Harp, two starts against your team when he played at Eastern New Mexico. Linebacker Corey Whitfield took one back against your team in the Cotton Bowl for a pick six. When you look at them on film, what do you see in the Lions? Well, every team you play in the Lone Star has guys like that. You know, Whitfield is uh, 
he's one of the better linebackers in the conference, if not the best. I mean, the guy can run and makes plays. We're watching uh, film earlier of the Kingsville game, and Kingsville has a long drive, gets down to the goal line, and Whitfield intercepts a pass and takes it 100 yards, and that gets your attention. And, you know, you have a flashback of a bad moment in the Cotton Bowl, and, and, uh, and there's some other guys like him over there, and so you know those guys can make plays. And then Harp, what a great competitor and uh, a guy that can run around and extend plays and run with the ball and make plays on you. So every team in the Lone Star has those kind of guys. you got to account for those to give yourselves a chance to win. Going back and looking at those highlights from the Cotton Bowl two years ago, uh, Drew Cuffey's pick looks just as good two years later, mm -hmm. let me tell you. Um, but let's talk about this Texas A&M Commerce team on paper. At, like Grant mentioned, 0-7. Looks like this should be a route for you guys, but tell, tell us about some concerns that you might have um, about Texas A&M Commerce. Well, the biggest thing is just concerns with our own team. We've got some guys banged up, as you normally do this time of year, and so uh, as the attrition of the season starts to take hold a little bit, you worry about um, you know certain positions and uh, guys being able to come out and, and play like they have the first seven games, you know, and, and when they're banged up. And we'll... We've got a few guys that, that might not be able to play, you know, or that are still um, that we're still evaluating even on game day, and so um, those are the concerns main, mainly with yourself. I mean, every team, like I said, has has players that can hurt you, and and uh, you got concerns every week with different phases of the other team, but uh, you're mainly concerned about yourself. In your four-game winning streak that was snapped last Saturday night, probably not coincidentally, you didn't once turn the ball over. Saturday night, you had a pick. Although it was on a dropped ball on fourth down, the ball was going to be turned over on downs anyway. But then you had a fumble on the goal line. So you lose that turnover battle in that game 2 nothing. You've only given the ball away eight times all year. That's tied for sixth in the nation in terms of number of giveaways. But only two teams have taken the ball away less than your team with eight takeaways. As you think about the potential of a deep playoff run, you've got to make it first. But then as you think about trying to go deep, can you continue to win games if you don't take the ball away? Uh, I mean, it's tough. I mean, you got to, you know, we talked about the game the other night. I mean, in the first quarter, there's three opportunities to yeah. take the ball away and, and uh, two interceptions we don't catch, a fumble that we get out and we don't recover. So, um, you know, the only thing you can do is to continue to work the turnover circuits and the things that you do during the week to try to, to help your guys uh, do that and, and throw and catch with the – secondary a little bit but uh, at the end of the day yeah you got to take the ball away and sometimes turnovers come in bunches either way so uh, really not concerned about that part of it so much right now just worried about this game and making sure we get some takeaways in this ball game and that game is at two o'clock today play well today as you try to bounce back from that tough loss at midwestern acu and texas a&m commerce at shotwell stadium two o'clock kickoff we'll have the pregame on the radio and online at 1 30. for the coach chris thompson and for austin Gwynn, i'm grant boone thanks for watching the chris thompson show We'll see you next week.